I want today to consider one of the harder questions that you might face this summer. Liberation theology and its relationship with Marx. And we could consider today uh, a question such as liberation theology is too depend on, dependent on Marxism. Discuss. Big question. We need to narrow these type of questions down. We need to take one or two maximum liberation theologians such as Leonardo Boff or Gustav Guterres. And then we need to work out one set of criticisms, and I suggest the criticisms the Roman Catholic Church produced in the form of the writings of Cardinal Ratzinger before he became Pope Benedict are quite sufficient to consider, and I've posted them on the PepEd website for you to read. And then we need to uh, take one or two elements of Marxism, not the whole of Marxist theory, that would be too much. And I'm suggesting perhaps that you might take the Marxist ideas of alienation and false consciousness. There are four sources of the false consciousness by which the poor accept their condition without question. They are capitalism, the ownership of wealth, institutions and God and religion. And Marx wrote this. Private property, he said, has made us so stupid that an object is only ours when we have it, and it exists for us as capital, or when it is, it is directly eaten, drunk, worn, inhabited, in short, used in some way. Thus all physical and intellectual senses have been replaced by the simple alienation of all these senses, by the sense of having. So within the capitalist society... The idea of ownership, and in our own generation perhaps consumerism, makes everything turned into a type of economic relationship. And so we simply see ourselves in terms of a kind of product or an image. And we define ourselves by what we own. All senses get subsumed into the one experience of owning and having, says Marx. And Marx therefore argues, and it's at this point that liberation theology really departs from Marx, in, he argues for a despotic inroad into property rights. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest, by degrees, all capital from the bourgeoisie. Of course, in the beginning, this cannot be affected except by means of despotic inroads into the rights of property. Now, this is interpreted in Marxism as a revolution that can include violence, the violent overthrow of the state as occurred in the Russian Revolution. And it's at this point, as I say, that liberation theology departs from Marxism because Liberation theology doesn't really take up it consistently this idea of a violent revolution. It uses Marxism as a useful tool in the analysis of the economic dependence and the false consciousness of the poor. Now, one example of that is Leonardo Boff. He talks about three key mediations. First, the socio-analytical mediation, which looks at the situation, the praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, the praxis of the poor, and asks why it occurs and what can be done about it. Here, Marx is useful, as I've said, as he analyses property, uses concepts of alienation and false consciousness to give meaning to the oppression that the poor face. False consciousness means the poor accept their condition. And liberation theology accepts this point and argues that the poor need to reorganise themselves in base communities, there to re-engage with the Bible and to find a prophetic word for that situation.
Secondly, we have the hermeneutical mediation, where hermeneutics is about the interpretation of the Bible. And the liberation theologian organises, as I've said, people into base communities in order to understand what God's word is saying to the situation of poverty and oppression. And it reads the Bible through the lens of oppression. And it finds a lot that the Bible says about these things. Thirdly, we have the practical mediation, which operates on the level of action. What can be done to confront the powers of oppression? Now, there have been, it is true, some liberation theologians who have espoused the cause of violence. But remember, there are many ways of producing political change and revolution in society. And it doesn't necessarily follow that you have to accept that violence results from direct action. Leonardo Boff concludes in, with these words, Marx can never be the guide, only a companion on the way, because you have only one teacher, Jesus Christ, Matthew 23, verse 10. Marxism does, as we've said, show what happens when Christian social principles become too otherworldly, when the emphasis is on enduring the situation here because the reward will be given after death in the new heaven and the new earth where everything will be transformed. Now this otherworldly view, very common in Western Christianity, actually evacuates the need for social analysis and social action. Theology becomes a key second act in that hermeneutic mediation. It's something that overcomes the critique of religion and the kind of power structures and the acceptance of power structures which are entailed in the world, word alienation. Liberation sees the church as part of the problem. And here we find the church in conflict often with liberation theology because the church has argued, the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America, that hierarchy is God-given. But the problem becomes what happens when the church becomes enmeshed, as it frequently does, in the power structures of the state, when that state is itself the instrument of oppression. And so the liberation theologian looks at sin, not just in terms of the self, but in terms of social structures and exploitation. And here, perhaps, Mary's song, known as the Magnificat, is a useful tool because the Magnificent says, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. There is judgment, if you like, in Marxist terms, on this false consciousness. God has brought down the rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble and the meek. There will be a material reversal in the liberation. God has filled the poor with good things. The poor will be rewarded, and unlike in the prosperity gospel, it is not the rich who are having the reward from God, but the poor who are seeing a kind of reversal in their state of being. So we can see a number of evaluative questions about liberation theology and Marx. First, has it reduced the kingdom of God merely to the political and the material? Secondly, has it destroyed traditional teaching on life after death and replaced it with a kind of life here on earth, a type of utopia. Cardinal Ratzinger came up with five principal criticisms after the Medellin Conference of 1967. There was too much emphasis, he said, on one type of sin, the structural sort, and a neglect of the traditional ideas of sin to do with the individual and repentance. 
There was too much emphasis on a certain type of liberation, political liberation. There was too much emphasis on praxis, context and the changing of a situation, rather than on grace, the activity of God working now in the world. And it was too exclusive, fourthly, in terms of its theological insight. Finally, he argues in that critique, which you can find incidentally on the Pepeb website, that the kingdom of God is not just about political struggle. It's not about kingdom here, now, today. It's about kingdom in its wider context. And so the final criticism by Ratzinger, Ratzinger, Ratzinger is to say liberation theology is too reductionist. It reduces concepts to things less than what they really are. To conclude, Christianity has become too closely enmeshed with power structures. That is the argument of liberation theology, using concepts of alienation and false consciousness that we find in Marx's theory. It has become private, individualistic, individualistic, captured by prosperity, itself, the church, an instrument of oppression. Key point. And liberation theology rediscovers, as does feminist theology, if you read Rosemary Ruther and other feminists, liberation theology rediscovers the strong themes of justice and practical action bursting out of the Old Testament in prophecies such as Isaiah, read chapter 60, for example, or Amos or Jeremiah, and so on. Moreover, taking the second mediation of Boff, the hermeneutical, when we read familiar stories like the feeding of the 5,000 or the healing of the demoniac man, then they assume a new and powerful Meaning, maybe in the end, it is the church that needs to change. <laughs>